Hi, I'm Joseph. Um, I do work on the Lightning Network. Um, my co-author, Tadius, couldn't be here because he's in Japan right now, so I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> so, um, today I'm mostly going to be talking about how Bitcoin does timestamping, ordering, a quick review. Um, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to be talking about how timestamping and ordering relates to Bitcoin and sort of the fundamentals. It's a quick review um, for probably everyone here. Um, how financial systems use time historically and today. Um, a quick refresher on the Lightning Network. And these, these three topics should be very quick. Um, and then I'll get into sort of a survey of time-related BIPs, specifically BIP 65 and 68. Uh, and using one of those BIPs to enforce off-blockchain ordering of transactions on Lightning. As pretty much everyone here knows, uh, the blockchain is really a timestamping system. Uh, On-chain transactions are ordered um, using blocks, and blocks sequentially, if it happens before another block, then you know what happened in the past. Um, and this system allows you to prevent double spending from if Alice sort of like sends money to both Bob and Carol, then only one will enter into a block in the future. And even Satoshi in the Bitcoin paper said that the solution begins with a timestamping server. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't work if it doesn't have a timestamping system in it. Um, and it sort of proves that the data must have existed uh, in time, obviously, in order to get the hash. So sort of like the hash of you know, the proof of work system and things like that. Um, so Alice sends one Bitcoin to Bob and Carol. Only one will get in. And double spending invalidates things. So if Alice has a transaction already in the blockchain, um, she creates a transaction with an output to Bob. It'll get into another block. Um, do you mind if you move a little bit because I think there's like block numbers on it. Thanks. So in a previous block, 350,000, that one enters in the blockchain, and then the other one enters in the blockchain in the next block. If Alice attempts to double spend later in time at 350,200, the transaction doesn't work because the output has already been spent in a prior block. Problem though, what if you wanted to do this all off blockchain, right? Um, blockchain, the blockchain's cool, but you know, scalability is be gonna become a really big problem long term, especially with micropayments, you know, like per megabyte transactions or whatever it is, or per article, um, like newspaper articles, like reading it. Um, 10 minute confirmation times is also a little too slow, paying for coffee, you don't really want to wait around for 10 minutes. And why should the entire world know that you bought a coffee yesterday, right? That's not so good, especially if your employer is also paying you in Bitcoin and knows what purchases you make as well. And sort of the entire world knows at this point. What we really need is having transactions be conducted off-chain and net settle everything without needing any trust or having counterparty risk. Um, I think Adam Bax calls this a right caching layer for Bitcoin. And I think that's sort of like one way to really think about it. So if you wanted to do this off-chain, I think it's pretty good to see how things are done today in the existing financial system. Um, existing financial system have a lot of time components involved. And there's also ordering of events, you know, the accounting ledger, if you will, right? They had to solve distributed systems problems of money for a very, very long time. Bank-to-bank um, -bank transfers is an example of distributed systems. You know, um, correspondent banking system tends to have, you know, um, many, many different banks 
conducting transactions on behalf of many, many different people. And they very often use time as a component for atomicity. Right? Any distributed system tends to have a sequential order of events, you know, like Paxos or Raft or whatever it is. And financial systems start looking very similar to a lot of computer science concepts that we work on very frequently. Um, and you know, overnight is a very, very big component to that. You know, um, oftentimes doing payments are conducted at the end of business day after all trading has closed. Um, you know, three business days, T plus three is very frequent um, in equities, especially in the U.S. markets. Um, Visa has a 180-day dispute period, right? Um, where you know you can do chargebacks and things like that. That's the real like confirmation time. Uh, the number might be a little bit different depending on what you know um, merchant agreement you have, but it's something along there. Um, and you know, with T plus three, um, a lot of systemic designs in our financial system is based on this, right? Uh, Regulation T, for example, relating to you know uh, lending of securities and things like that. And the real solution for scalability that financial systems have found are to use clearinghouses. And correspondent banking is a sort of more distributed clearinghouse. You know, there's organizations dedicated to this for different types of systems, right? Um, ACH systems have their own. Um, the DTCC for equities, you know, SWIFT for, you know, wire transfers, and OCC for options, right? Um, sort of routing payments using, you know, many, many distributed systems is a great way to solve this trust problem and diffusing out the amount of data that needs to be conducted. And in the 1800s, there was a very, very early example of this. Um, this is one of the first clearinghouses in the world. This was in London. And Essentially what happened was all the banks were just carrying sacks of money to other banks and that became like very very risky So instead they decided this is stupid. Let's just net settle everything, right? If I'm carrying, you know, 150 pounds or whatever it is to this bank and that bank's also carrying 80 pounds back to me Well, really we should only be moving 20 pounds. This is this is all silly. So they, they said at the end one time per day they would net settle everything and have a clearing house and then just make payments to each other. And um, it was actually Charles Babbage that wrote about this for you know, how the system was conducted. You know, it's one of the in earlier manual data structures, right? Um, later in New York, they optimized it to be closer to O of N. Everyone on the outside of a table and the inside of a table and they would conduct their transactions and everything would clear up at the end of the day. <laughs> it's really cool. It's really novel. Um, but Bitcoin can do better, right? Um, all the previous examples require a lot of trust. And if the trust breaks down, the system sort of grinds to a halt. Um, with Bitcoin, we have multi-sig. And we also have Bitcoin scripting. And that allows for decentralized contracts that counterparties can come into and form agreements. And by removing the need for this trust and the need for a reputation, we can eliminate entry costs into participating in this system. So, you know, not everyone here can be a DTCC, right? Not everyone here can be SWIFT. Um, ideally, you want to eliminate the cost for participation. And by doing so, you reduce transaction costs and, and efficiency, and increase efficiency. And functionally, you want the blockchain to act as a dispute mediation service, as court, if you will. Um, not every transaction goes to court. Not every contract goes to court. Probably an extremely, extremely small minority. But it's nice that it's there. And the blockchain can offer that. Um, so pretty much all contracts happen off-chain, off-court. Um, but if something bad happens, you have that as a good backup. It's a sort of programmatic adjudication of the system. I'm going to give a really, really quick light overview of the Lightning Network. Um, if you are more curious, I think I gave a previous presentation at the SF Bitcoin Devs. Um, Denise will be able to link it at the bottom. 
Yeah, it's on the SF Bitcoin Devs YouTube channel or something. Okay. Our website, sfbitcoindevs.com. sfbitcoindevs.com? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'll give a very, very quick overview. Um, it's a network of Bitcoin payment channels. So if you have a 202 multi-sig, where if you make it, need to make a transaction, it needs to come to agreement between both parties. Um, and these are real Bitcoin transactions, which can be net settled on chain at any time. And it uses hashed time lock contracts, which are payments conditional upon knowledge of a secret pre-image R, which produces a hash H uh, within N blocks. And conventionally I've used three days as a convention. So if you presume Alice wants to send money to Dave, uh, Dave tells Alice, here's this hash H. Um, if you know R, which does produce H, um, consider your payment fulfilled. So uh, let's say Alice is like buying a cup of coffee or something. Um, Alice doesn't have a direct channel open with Dave. Alice only has a direct channel with Bob and a couple other people. Um, and those arrows represent um, Bitcoin blockchain payment channels. Um, so those, those lines represent a single transaction which is on-chain. Um, Alice doesn't have a direct channel open with Dave, so she finds a route through Bob and Carol. And what happens is Alice tells Bob, um, if you can produce within three days R, I will send you 0.01 Bitcoin. And then Bob tells Carol the same, within two days, and Carol, t Carol tells Dave, Bob and Carol don't yet have R, but when Carol tells Dave, Dave goes, oh yeah, I have R, and I kinda want 0.01 Bitcoin, so I'm gonna redeem it, and give, give you R, and by giving you R, Carol can elect to broadcast on the blockchain, or they can settle off-chain inside the payment channel, which they do, and Carol can redeem it from Bob, and Bob can redeem it from Alice. And that's sort of how the Bitcoin Lightning Network works. All this happens off the blockchain, but if they come to disagreement at any time during this step, they can enforce this contract on the Bitcoin blockchain. But the question is, how exactly can you order these transactions off-chain? Without hitting the blockchain every time a payment is made, it's sort of like you don't know who owns what, right? If you've made a payment off chain, how do you prove that it happened today or next week or any time, right? How do you know that it's the most recent one? Um, and you sort of need to enforce that because if you can't really rely on the other person being honest because you know this is Bitcoin and who knows, right? Um, and in order to do so, we need to start thinking about how to enforce time inside a Bitcoin transaction itself. And there are two current BIPs. Lightning doesn't require them, but it's really, really, really nice if BIP68 gets in. Um, BIP65 is really, really cool. It's um, OP check lock time verify made by Peter Todd. And BIP68 is consensus enforced transaction replacement signaled via sequence numbers. It's very, very close to what um, we previously proposed as a relative check lock time verify. Um, it's a slight optimization. I think it's a lot better. Um, and it was made by Mark Friedenbach. Um, so a Bitcoin transaction does have some time and sequence related structure inside of it. There's a lock time, colloquially called end lock time because that's what it is inside the code. Um, and there's also a sequence um, number which by default, sort of doesn't do anything right now. Um, so what BIP65 proposes is it's an opcode that lets you script time. And when me and Taj like were talking about this, he was like, "This is the most expensive time stamping system in the world, but you can't tell time in it." <laughs> That's really weird, right? Um, so check lock time verify lets you tell time inside the Bitcoin script. Um, so the script evaluates is true if it is after some block height that you give it. So you know if you set a block height of you know four hundred thousand, 
than if you append check lock type verify and <coughs> so OP drop after it. Um, it'll evaluate as true only after the transaction being spent is after that block height, if it's included in, in a block after that block height, at or after. And it's really, really useful to commit to the world some kind of time dependency. Um, and it's also useful for some limited malleability fixes. Um, the time dependency stuff is really interesting because you can create a transaction which cannot be spent until after a certain date. And there's some interesting things you could do with that. And that's sort of how the limited malleability fix uses it. So they use that, an example for that in a payment channel is if you have a two, a two of two transaction, which is signified by a checksig verify on Bob and a checksig on Alice, um, after a certain date, it only requires Alice's signature. So, you know, if the transaction gets mutated or something like that, then Alex can eventually get her money back. And that's pretty useful, and that's pretty cool. Um, and there are some limitations, though, under this type of payment channel. It's mostly single fun funder, uh, unidirectional, and there's some limited time duration. Um, and it's not really compatible with Lightning Network, but it's very, very useful for committing after a certain date or creating you know, non-revocability. Um, so BIP68 has a proposal to redefine sequence numbers. And sequence numbers are in every single input, and it's sort of not used today because it doesn't work. Um, it's sort of semi-disabled, but it's not really, re replacements aren't relayed on the P2P network, which is why it doesn't really work right now. And the prior work, the prior way of work doesn't work because there's denial of service attack vulnerabilities, and it's impossible to guarantee that miners will pick the highest sequence number. So the way it works before was if you had a transaction with a higher sequence number, then it'll mine that transaction, it'll prefer that transaction. Uh, there's no guarantee for you, if you are a miner, that you're gonna get that transaction at all, right? And if you're another user that was watching the Bitcoin blockchain, it was like, hey, someone broadcasted something with a lower one, they should have broadcast something with a higher one. I'm gonna broadcast my higher transaction, but by the time you broadcast and by the time the miner gets it, what if it's mined, right? The previous one. So you can't really enforce order using sequence number, although that was the original, probably the original intention. Um, so the re redefinition is to say, if the sequence number is built in, require the output being spent to have a relative number minimum of con confirmations, um, relative to from the child being spent from the parent. Um, so for example, if there's a transaction which has hit the blockchain and there's a child num that's sequence number 500, then there must be 500 blocks between these two transactions. And the sequence number is put inside the child transaction. So that may seem a little bit confusing. Let's try to clear this up. So white means a transaction that hasn't put into the blockchain. Um, green means it's in the blockchain. Assume it's block 349, 999. Um, Alice and Bob both have transaction A and transaction B1. Transaction B1 is in, looks like a normal transaction except it has a sequence number of 200. And Neither party can unilaterally change that because the output of transaction A is a multi-sig output with Alice and Bob. So in order to create transaction B1, both Alice and Bob have to cooperate. <coughs> so Alice can't unilaterally say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend this 0.1 Bitcoin because Bob's like, Whoa, what? So in 350,000, Presume, let's say Alice broadcasts transaction A. Assume they both have transaction A and B1 and either one can broadcast at any time. Transaction B1 can't be broadcast yet because it has a sequence number of 200, right? Under BIP 68, it would require block 350,000 to 200 in order to be broadcast. So if it's at 150, they still can't broadcast. But at 200, hey, um, either party can now broadcast this transaction onto the blockchain. 
So the question is like, why is this really useful? Why is this interesting, right? Like, okay, great, you delayed a payment. No big deal, right? It's really, really cool because you can establish conditional rules based on different transactions which double spend from the same input, um, which are all valid, um, at diff but they're all valid at different times. So if one gets in before another, then the other ones you made are all not valid, right? So you can create transactions that are revocable simply by making one with a lower sequence number. So if there's one with 1,000 and another one with zero, well, the zero can go in today, but the one with 1,000, you're gonna have to wait some amount of time, like, I don't know, like seven, eight days, something like that. So here's an example of that, right? Instead of just transaction A and transaction B1, um, transaction A and transaction B1 are the same, but now there's a new transaction that both Alice and Bob agreed to, that they both signed, and they both made this transaction, and it has a sequence number of zero. And the only difference is that the money goes to Alice now instead of Bob, right? So assume Alice and Bob have all of these transactions, transaction A, transaction B1, and transaction B2. If Alice broadcasts transaction A, and it's block height 350,000, Alice can broadcast transaction B2 and the money's hers now, right? Transaction B1 can't go in until 350,200. So simply by signing transaction B2, you've revoked transaction B1, provided that some party broadcast part transaction B2 before transaction B1 gets valid. If let's say Alice doesn't broadcast transaction B2, then transaction B1 will eventually become valid, and it's sort of not really revoked at that point. So the trade-off is you sort of need to watch the blockchain before the sequence number becomes unrevoked. Not the sequence, the transaction, sorry. So sort of to, to have a quick review, um, by creating a broadcast spends with lower sequence numbers, it's possible to conduct transactions off-chain and spends from this transaction sort of create a dispute resolution period where either party may dispute this transaction that enters onto the blockchain um, by creating one which doesn't have, which has a sequence number of zero or FFFF or whatever it is. And how does this apply to the Lightning Network? Um, this isn't a hard requirement. You can use lock time and lock time, but by doing it this way, channels can remain open indefinitely. And with malicious counterparties, they can really only lock up funds to whatever you set the sequence number on the revocable transaction. So it's really a limited number of times. So like, let's say if you set it up for like, the sequence number to be equivalent to about one month, if your counterparty decides to be a jerk, they can really only hold your funds up for one month and then you get your money back, which is pretty cool. Um, with end lock time, it'll be until channel expiration, which, you know, if you want the channel to be open for a year, it'll last a year. Um, both these BIPs, I think, in some way, are probably going to get in. Um, end lock time is, I think, scheduled. I mean, not end lock time. The OP check lock time verify is supposed to be the next one after, um, well, BIP 66 just got in, so. Oh, aren't, um, they, aren't, those, aren't these redundant? They are not redundant. So what's the difference between BIP65 and 68 is that BIP65 is scripted on the parent's output. So, and that value is a hard block height value. Um, so you would, for OP check lock time verify, you'd be using um, 350,200 or whatever it is. Whereas this one is actually 200. And it's dependent upon when the parent gets into the blockchain, and it's useful because you don't know when the parent is going to enter into the blockchain. Yeah. So I'm going to describe how Lightning Network channels work. It may be a little bit confusing, but I'll do my best. Um, so each commitment has two versions with the same output, one for Alice and one for Bob, after the channel is created. Or, well, you created before, but anyway. Um, only Alice can broadcast Alice's version, and only Bob can broadcast Bob's version. 
And the final payout is locked via sequence number in order to make this payout revocable. So to revoke the commitment, um, the final payout will go to the counterparty and that creates incentive for you not to broadcast that commitment transaction. So if Alice and Bob have a channel open and it's entered into the blockchain, which is denoted in green. Um, so the green means it's actually hit the Bitcoin blockchain. Anything in white, it has not hit the Bitcoin blockchain and this is all being done off chain. So on the left side is Alice's version and on the right side is Bob's version. And ultimately the payout comes out to be the same. 0.5 to Alice, 0.5 to Bob. And you both have to wait 200 blocks because there's a sequence number of 200. And the output for the commitment requires cooperation of both Alice and Bob. In order to create commitments, it requires the cooperation of Alice and Bob. Um, Alice is only able to broadcast commitment 1A because Bob has given Alice's, Alice his signature to spend from the channel. But Alice has not given Bob her signature. So Alice has Bob's signature for commitment 1A, and Bob has Alice's signature for commitment 1B, and of course you can sign your own, you know, using your own key. And presume it's block 350,000. If Alice for some reason says, hey, I kind of want to close this channel. I, I know we just made it, well, I want out. Alice can only broadcast commitment 1A, and because, by broadcasting commitment 1A and having that enter into the blockchain, the other side, commitment 1B, cannot be broadcast because they're spending from the same output. However, neither party can broadcast the spend from this. It's sort of locked up for 200 blocks unless they both cooperate to make a new revocable transaction, right? They have to wait for 200 blocks. So assume this is block 350, 100. You have to wait for 300 for in order to broadcast the revocable transaction, right? So 300, hey, this transaction's in. Everyone has their money back. Alice and Bob both put in 0.5.5. They got out 0.5.5. Now, this is sort of pointless because they made no transaction inside the channel. Let's look what happens when they make a transaction inside this channel. In order to make a uh, payment inside this channel, both parties need to agree and they both create new commitment transactions to replace and new revocable transactions as well. And the payout ultimately denotes who has paid what. So Alice has paid 0.1 to Bob. So the new balance is 0.4 to Alice and 0.6 to Bob. And both Alice, if Alice broadcasts, that's the payout, and if Bob broadcasts, that's what's the payout. However, there's a problem. The old commitment transactions are still around. Each of these four commitment transactions are all double spends of the same output. Now, hey, double spends, double spend problem, right? You're gonna be making a lot of commitment transactions. If you're Alice, why don't you use broadcast commitment 1A where the output is 0 0.5, 0 0.5, right? I know, I, like Alice says, I know I've paid Bob, but I'm just gonna broadcast that, right? You can't prove to the blockchain order. This is all off chain. So how do you solve that? So in order to solve that, I've swapped commitment one and commitment two. See, these are commitment two. Assume commitment two is still around and these revocable transition, transactions are still here. Um, but let's look at commitment one. After commitment two is signed, what you do is you say, I as Alice know the current balance is 0.4.6. But what I say now is, if I broadcast commitment one, I'm gonna give you all my money. I'm gonna prove to you that I'm going to act honestly, because if I act dishonestly, you can take all the money from this channel. So how is this done? Alice creates a new spend, double spend, from the old commitment transactions, and all old commitment transactions have this, where there is no sequence number, so effectively there is no delay that Bob can broadcast, and she gives this to Bob, right? She says, if you broadcast, if I broadcast commitment one, you broadcast breach remedy 1A, and the final payout goes to you, right? So let's look what happens if Alice actually does that. 
If Alice actually does that, she broadcasts commitment 1A. Let's say, let's say we're up to like commitment like 1,000 or something, right? And commitment 1,000, the current balance is actually 0.1 to Alice, 0.9 to Bob. And Alice is like, well, let, let me just broadcast this onto the blockchain because, hey, I'm just going to take the money, right? What happens is, is that Bob immediately notices that commitment 1A has entered into a block and just takes all the money by spending from that. Because what happens is Alice has to wait 200 blocks because the sequence number value is 200, right? So what happens is in, at block 350,100, she broadcasts commitment 1A. It's in, entered into that block. In the next block, Bob goes, Bob goes hey, uh, you just did this and it's in a block, I'm gonna take all the money now. So what happens is, is that every single old commitment transaction has this breach remedy transaction that each counterparty has. So for you as an individual, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna be like, well, I'm never gonna broadcast my old commitment transaction because that's just giving all of my, my, my money to the other guy, right? So. What do you do? You're probably just going to destroy the old commitment transactions. You're going, to, you're going to be like, well, I know I have a commitment 1A, but I'm just not ever going to touch it. I'm just going to throw it away. I'm going to delete it from my disk. What you do is you do keep the other party's breach remedy transactions, though. So if the other party in the future, let's say one year from now, broadcasts you know, commitment 1A or whatever it is, well, you are going to need, need to be able to enforce this contract. And the way you enforce this contract is by keeping this information. You can compress the information in interesting ways, but you keep this information just in case the other party is a jerk. And this creates decentralized enforceability of contracts. And I think that's really interesting. So both parties should only broadcast the current one. If they don't, they lose all their money. And the result is, you're gonna to have to watch the blockchain periodically. And how often you watch the blockchain is dependent on what you set the sequence number value to be. So if you set it to be about the equivalent of one month, you're gonna probably have to check once a month. But it's not you that necessarily has to check. You can delegate it to a third party. Um, and if you delegate it to a third party, you don't give them any custodial risk. This third party doesn't take your money. But you have to trust them to actually do it. <laughs> but if you give it to a thousand people, Maybe you're pretty good, you know? Um, or you could, you know, check the blockchain yourself once a month. Not that bad either. Um, so what does this mean? What type of, this type of construction means that it's possible to order transactions off-chain. By having this penalty structure, if you broadcast an older transaction, you lose all your money. And that, in effect, makes it so that anything older than the current revision is invalidated. Much like how in a blockchain, you know, you can't double spend two transactions. With this, if you try to, in, in effect, it's not really double spend, but try to take someone else's money by misappropriating the order of transactions, you're gonna lose all your money. And everything stays off chain under this model, provided that both parties are cooperative. So people can leave channels open for hypothetically many years at a time. Um, however, if they suddenly stop being cooperative or outright malicious, you can notice what they're doing on the blockchain and enforce this penalty. And by having this penalty, it creates sufficient incentives to act honestly. And by having this type of structure, and having these channels as sort of building block, payments can be routed over a untrusted network of participants. So if Alice wants to send money to Dave, she can do it using these hash time lock contracts in each of these channels. And in each step of these channels, that's sort of how things are being enforced. And payments can be made completely off chain and they only settle on chain periodically or when non-cooperative. That's sort of it, and that's sort of how it works. So you have questions? I'm sorry if it was a little bit confusing. <laughs> yeah.
Sorry, we're all dead. So the transaction that Alice has that Bob doesn't have, mm -hmm. uh, how does Bob verify the breach remedy if Bob doesn't have the commitment when a transaction itself? Right. So Bob will eventually, so if Alice maliciously broadcast to Commitment 1A, let's say we're at Commitment 1000, right? Right, right. What Alice is doing right here is broadcasting Commitment 1A onto the blockchain. Right, right. So, so what happens is that now everyone in the world has a copy. Right, so, so Bob can see that transaction, uh -huh. out, but uh, it says only Alice can broadcast. Uh -huh. So that must mean Alice only has the only person who has that transaction. At the time, before she broadcasts, so the, re the reason Al only Alice can broadcast is because Bob gives, to spend from, to create a commitment one A, you're spending from a multi-sig two of two Alice and Bob output. Right, you see the very top? Right. So you're gonna need two signatures. You need Alice's signature and Bob's signature in order to create a transaction spending from that output. So what happens is Bob gives Alice his signature for commitment 1A. But Alice doesn't give Bob her signature. Oh, okay, that's that. Makes yeah. So, uh, and if Alice gives Bob her signature, that's really bad. You don't want to do that. Yeah. That's because the then you can broadcast the breach remedy and you just take all the money. That's, 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 that's the part of this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Next question. Can I have a follow up question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the breach yes. remedy. Okay. Can you guys wait for the mic, please? Pleasure. We just. So does that mean the, the breach remedy, um, I, I'm a little rusty on the Bitcoin data structure, but the breach remedy references the previous transactions hash, and that hash does not depend on having the signatures in place, is that right? So in the actual transaction, you will be referencing the TXID of the previous transaction, that is correct. So, um, but um, in order to create this whole Lightning Network, this, this payment channel structure, it depends on what you do for the signature. Um, so me and Taj really like not signing the inputs, but that can be a little bit tricky. Um, some other people like different constructions um, depending on how you sign your inputs. So is that still a little bit undecided on how you actually implement that with not, with not requiring the signature to be in place? Oh yeah, Craig Maxwell is here. He's the grand Bitcoin <laughs> Yeah, so this requires a different checksig operator that lets you control exactly what you're covering on the signature. There are many different ways to do it, and there's a dispute among technical people about which is the best path, but it is very clearly possible, and nobody working on the technology has any doubt that we'll be able to do one form of the so, All right, great. Thank you. Thank you. Next question? Uh, it, does this uh, do all these multi sigs get denser with Schnorr signatures? Denser is what? So you can just have a single. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's sort of yeah. You could you could do that. Very I mean, um, using Schnorr signatures, you could compress some things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the order, the order of operations may be a little bit tricky. <laughs> The question was, can these, these multi-signatures be made more efficient? Well, since, since getting the data out from under the signature requires a new checksig operator, we know how to construct a checksig operator where, where a, like a two of two is the same size as a one of one today, and so that will like, have the size of the signatures in these transactions, and we'd sort of get that for free as part of the new checksig operator. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, there's really nothing stopping you um, using a two of two. If you, if you did more of that, under this is very simple. Uh, two small questions. Uh, first, uh, this is awesome. When can, I, when can I use it? And the second question is, um, after the transaction 1A, um, then Bomb has to do the uh, breach remedy transaction. And, and I think there's a constraint that it's actually um, uh, that it actually goes into the blockchain within this period of time before um, this 200 blocks. So there's a little assumption that as soon as as a, a transaction is broadcast, it, it, it eventually and within a limited time goes into the blockchain, right? Yeah. So I mean, you're going to have to be able to get the breach remedy and transaction in probably before 200 blocks. 
So you really want to get it in. I mean, that's why you sort of set this value, the sequence number value, to be fairly high. Um, 200 blocks is a little bit over a day. You probably don't want it that low. You know, you set it to a month. You have a month. If commitment warning gets in, and you know Bob isn't watching, then yeah, Alice can broadcast that after you know whatever time you set. Um, and it presumes that you know you do get it in the blockchain in time. Um, there's some assumptions we to that, and some mitigations. Um, your first question was about when can you use it, and this entire system is dependent upon getting some malleability fixing. You don't necessarily need the BIP68, although it's nice, but you do need that malleability fix um, in order to be able to create transactions um, without necessarily knowing the exact um, input values. Um, so if you want to get it in sooner, bother Greg. Just <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Don't bother Greg. <laughs> Next question. Um, you mentioned like using BIP68 for like well, to check on time um, for um, yeah. also very time, but um, isn't BIP68 BIP like insufficient for the security of the system because you only um, enforce a mempool, or you actually even need it to be enforced on the chain level? Yeah. Um, the so the change is enforcing it on the chain level. Uh, BIP68 is only mempool as far as I know. So like, oh, mine is still mine, but you know, and then now BIP68 transaction. So there needs to be another software. As far as okay. Yeah, it might be another software. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right oh, okay. I meant red wrong. Yeah, anyway. It's only memorable. Like, you need oh, an op right. sequence verify, so, which is in elements. But, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Op sequence verify. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's kind of cool for this without an opcode. That way you can change it after the fact, right? The, but you, the, the, you need opcode to um, have verification. So you, um, you have mempool replacement, but to, you need opcode to have um, chain, actually, to so verify in the chain. You can do it with. All uh, right, we can talk later. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. For sure. That's a good point. Thanks for the question. Uh, so, taking this to its logical extreme, uh -huh. uh, in a far future, uh, the miners will be paid only if somebody is being dishonest. I'm sorry? In the far future, the miners will be paid only if somebody somewhere is being dishonest. Or if you want to close out the channel for some reason, you want to change the participants. Um, Somebody goes offline. Yeah, somebody goes offline. Incompetence. <laughs> and the, the cool thing there is that they could be paid an awful lot in those cases because since they are rare, you can increase the fees that you pay. Yeah. The assumption is minor fees go up dramatically. Um, in that initial the channel multi sig one, is that like the liquidity of one point oh Bitcoin? Does that have to be provided by the two parties who are setting up the channel, or is there any way to have like a third party provide that liquidity? So there's interesting constructions you can do by having funds move backwards. So you can have liquidity provided by other participants. So if you presume there's a relationship between like Bob and Carol and a channel open, and let's say the channel isn't open, like it, it's open for you know let's say one Bitcoin, and there's a lot of moving money moving in the other in one direction, you can move money in the other direction in order to ensure that this channel is free. Yeah, you could, you could uh, for example, have like the Alice and Bob just to each other. Uh -huh. sure. You could have Alice go plop down money right now mm -hmm. uh, in exchange and participate in the reset up so who gets what amount of output in exchange for Carol potentially getting a greater like, interest in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There could be some kind of like sort of rebate for providing this sort of liquidity, yeah. So that way there's incentive for channels to remain open. So if a lot of money is moving that way, then if you're Bob and Carol, you sort of don't care if you pay out some amount of money in order to keep the channel moving because there's more, more money moving in the opposite direction. Which is interesting. Have you thought about um, doing such a channel with more than two participants? Should be possible, right? It's, okay, 
There is a construction to do with more participants by making the payouts not be a penalty to the other party because how do you structure the penalty, right? That's the question, right? If it's more than one participant, you can do this like skipping fast forward thing. We can talk about it. <laughs> Next question. Uh, in your opinion, does the system perhaps become less necessary over time with Gavin Anderson's uh, proposed scaling schedule of doubling the size of blocks every two years for the next 20 years to a very high number of transactions per block? So, I have two answers for that. One is, if you assume blocks are going to get very big, the security model gets very complicated. My second answer would be, let's presume it magically works. Right? Let's presume infinite block sizes, everything works. Even if, you, okay. Let me backtrack a little bit. You need some kind of fee market, right? You need, fees aren't going to be zero. Fees should be fairly high. And if you presume that high being relative, well, I think one dollar is pretty high, but if you assume a relative fee market, and if you assume there is some relative constraints against the you know, service attacks, different transactions have different value in order to be ensured that the payment has been made. So if you make a micropayment for a newspaper, or you know, a micropayment for the you know, internet or whatever it is, you probably have less priority than someone paying for a house. What Lightning Network does is solve this dilemma of relative value of transactions. I think that's actually the first thing it solves. Um, it's sort of a roundabout way to go about it, like to think about it, but if you have everything off chain, it doesn't matter what the value is because you're willing to do these transactions off chain because when it hits on chain, yeah, it's going to be relatively expensive, but you can net settle all your small purchases. Um, so I don't think the value will go down over time, even if you solve blocks by making different blocks. Well, the other point is that yeah, transaction yeah, 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 faster is nice. Yeah. Um, although, arguably, you get a new one for funding that might be fine for some people, but don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, maybe you just said it, but uh, the other one just said you have instant confirmation, right? Uh -huh. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, doing the instant confirms. That's nice. We have more questions, guys. No questions? Come on, guys. There we go. Uh, I, I have a pretty naive question. How is this path initiated? How does Alice know that there's a path between Bob and Carol to get me big? So that's actually a very tricky question. <laughs> yeah. Routing, routing uh, is it's doable. Um, one way you can do it is you can get a full map of this entire network. Let's say, let's say you know you run a Bitcoin full node. You can look at the blockchain to look at two of two transactions. And you sort of have a nice map already. Um, in terms of the actual routing, um, Rusty Russell has actually put a lot of thought into that, and it's kind of what we're talking about. It. So, um, but it's relatively solvable, but there's different trade-offs for each solution. Um, if you had, you know, 1,000 nodes that you miss and you give it to the other party. Like 1,000 nodes, or routes to 1,000 nodes and you give it to the other party. And if they find a match, then they just route that way. That's a possible solution that's fairly decentralized. Do you make clients a lot of all this? Because I don't think people are going to do all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's programmed in. You want to do it? My grandma. <laughs> yeah. She could, but wanting to is a different question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All 
So back to routing for a second. It seems like routing would be much easier if there are like two or three or four hubs. Um, yep. And like a lot of complications would kind of go away in that sense. So uh, in your like grand vision of like a lightning network, do you see it more like you know like Coinbase is a hub, Bitbase is a hub, or do you think like there are lightning nodes that will you know themselves maintain routing tables and updates and such? I think it's a distinct possibility that there are at least a couple core backup nodes where, you know, sure, there's, you know that there's this very popular service and maybe out of the thousand that you have, maybe there's ten that you're pretty sure everyone else has. But you're also thinking about the routes because maybe those routes are cheaper or faster or whatever it is. So I don't think those routes are guaranteed to consume all of the traffic. Um, on the other hand, you know, there is some risk by trying to monopolize the market. If you try to monopolize the market, you're putting a lot of money at stake. And by doing that, I mean, there's ways to mitigate it by you know, moving money around, by being sort of pseudo-liquidity providers in a way. But you're still gonna have a lot of chance over it, so it's kind of tricky. Um, ideally, you want them to be reasonably disincentivized from you know, trying to monopolize it. And I think it's unlikely for even you know, two to three Two more questions. Right. Uh, so this is going to be a little bit convoluted. Right. Uh, I'm in gaming. We have all cryptocurrency, game, and coin. And I think um, the examples that you presented works very well in gaming because gamers like to be in all kinds of shady areas and bet each other 10, 20 bucks in the game and ad and so on and so forth. So there are going to be some off, um, um, some off the blockchain transactions later. Um, the problem that I run into is that I have to like get all the smart things that you guys come up with and dumb it down and explain to gamers as simply as possible. Ideally, you don't need to know any of this, right? Okay. Ideally, you make a payment to someone and it goes through. I mean, do you know how ACH or Swift or any of that stuff works? I don't. Okay. <laughs> but it all works. All right, well, so that way works by a trust, but you know, you kind of wanted to work without trust, but. Yeah, ideally you make a payment to someone that goes through, you're good to go. Okay. Yeah. So last question. Uh, so one of the open questions to me that I, I guess I'm not fully grappling with is, uh, so I understand the need for the fee market of mining, and obviously um, if you're going to be opening a payment channel, you're going to be putting money that is inaccessible to you uh, for some period of time. Uh, and is there going to be, in your envisioning, you know, how this network gets created, um, is there going to be a standardized fee st structure, basically, for uh, how, how much money you are putting within a channel that's locked up in a channel? Is that going to be like a percentage basis? Like, are you talking about for blockchain or for inside the channel? Oh, for inside the network, oh. yeah. So, so um, you know, there's a need for an open fee market in, in, you know, for miners and uh -huh. for everyone else. Um, what mechanism do you see because I can imagine like situations where that monopolization of certain person saying, hey, I've got a million channels open to everybody, just work through me and then I can charge them. You know, I'm not sure, I'm not, I don't even know how to It's just whoever gives you the cheapest route and you know, is fairly effective and then they're done. You know, so ideally the fees go very, very close to zero. Okay. Um, you know, the fee is a signed integer, it can be negative. You can't be paid to, you know, let's say Bob and Carol's moving a lot of money in one way. If you know, like, if you're that guy in the middle, you want to move money in the other way, and maybe Bob and Carol's willing to pay you money. So there's situations where fees can be negative, and it's leaving quiet, right? And you want to pick up, you know, a couple cents or whatever. All right. Well, thank you all.